So our last bit of this has a some physical and chemical nature to it. So the last bit of evidence we're going to be talking about in the sort of physical evidence side of things is polymers and synthetic fibers, and we'll contrast those to the natural fibers that we talked about last time. So we'll talk about polymer basics, the terminology, and and discuss synthetic polymers. So one of the things that can may can impact the evidence a little bit is uh, some chain growth mechanisms, how we grow polymers. Um, I will talk about superglue and its forensic applications, and then the properties of polymers and their fibers. And so then we talked about uh, the biopolymers last time. So now we're over here on this side of the uh, of this classification scheme in synthetic organic polymers. And you see that one of the ways you can classify these polymers is how they're created, either through addition or condensation mechanisms or ring opening polymers. And we've got terminology that uh, you may recognize like epoxies. You know, that sort of tells you that it's a ring opening type polymer because of the epoxide group. So we'll get into the, some of those details. Uh, as far as polymer terminology, this is a bit of a repeat from last time. We have this monomer here and almost all of the monomers, in fact, all of the ones that we talk about today, they have to have some functionality that allows them to polymerize. Now, this is uh, uh, this can happen even when you're you're not trying to make it happen. You can have certain uh, chemicals that that can polymerize uh, when you don't expect it, and that's how Teflon was discovered. So they had uh, uh, tetra or per perfluoroethylene in a tank. It was a gas. And they went to use it in an experiment. They turned it on, and there was no pressure. And I thought, wow, it leaked out. We didn't we didn't notice that it leaked out, but it seems like it all leaked out. Well, they weighed the tank, and it still seemed full by mass. So they cut open the tank, and the Teflon was inside. <laughs> it had polymerized. Now that's going to be an exothermic polymerization, so it was a bit risky. It happened, and it was it, apparently the tank warmed up and then cooled back down. But some of these uh, polymerizations can be exothermic. And you'll see that on some of the safety data sheets. So in the physical properties on the safety data sheets, uh, one of the properties is exothermic polymerization risk. And most of the time it says no. But if that says yes, then you need to pay attention to how you store that chemical. Uh, of course, we have the mechanical properties that are based upon how these polymers are linked together. We talked about cross-linking and branching and so on. And uh, these are different ways we can fine tune the, the polymer properties. We discussed last time this uh, temperature response curve and talked about shape memory. We broke the plastic tube. Uh, we talked about memory foam is, is, is really more like a, like a, a gum rather than a, than a polymer or rubber. And then we talked about the glass transition temperature being one of those uh, properties that we can follow for a polymer. Uh, that will change based upon its composition. We talked about taking natural fibers like cotton and reacting them, making semi-synthetic fibers like cellulose acetate fibers. And so let's get into how we can do some of the other chemical production of, of polymers. So let's take these synthetic polymers and look at different ways of polymerizing these polymers. We'll start out with chain growth polymers where we have the monomers and they can grow in three different ways. You can, you can have the propagating species be an anion. So you make a, the monomer, you turn it into an anion species, and then it attacks uh, nuclei. Those electrons in the anion go towards a positive portion of the next monomer, and they grow by propagating that anion to the next molecule. So the end of that polymer as it's growing is anionic, and that's the mechanism that it grows. And so you can imagine that if you have anionic growth, then it's going to focus on those positive parts of the molecule as it, and, and you may get a, a different um, chain length, different polymer properties uh, based upon whether you use anionic or cationic. So if you have a cationic growth and you're, you've got a, a positive propagating center, and then electrons are going to be attracted to that. And so you're going to have potentially different properties of that polymer if it's um, cationic uh, mediated. And then free radical, you can split that double bond into a diradical, and then you can have a propagating species where it's a single electron and it's going and, and creating bonds that way. Now, how do we get these things started? The initiator and the, and the catalysts 
can give us evidence. So in this case, um, this is a, a pre-catalyst or an initiator, this nickel center. And so it's going to be a trace, a trace impurity in that polymer. And so how would you detect this? Well, you could maybe detect some of these phosphorus compounds. Okay. So you're making an organic polymer, but if you have some phosphorus impurities in there, you might see that in a mass spec. You might see the, um, the um, isotope pattern for phosphorus. And so that would be a, a, um, forensically relevant. You might see nickel. Where, how would you detect nickel, a nickel compound? And again, for really a trace contamination in a, in a, in a polymer, how would you detect the nickel? So for your metals, you're going to want to look at uh, probably ICPMS. And, and there's really a couple of flavors of ICP. So let me go ahead and just review a little bit. This is inductively coupled plasma. And that's like 10,000 Kelvin. So what it does is it burns up whatever the sample is and frees individual atoms. And it's really good for metals, for trace metals. Now you can look at the emission, so optical emission spectroscopy. So there you're, you're you kind of have to predict what lines you want to look at. Um, I guess you could collect all of them if you had a diode array um, and then see what metals correspond to that. But most of the time you're doing quantitative analysis if you're using OES and you're picking particular wavelengths, like you're testing for lead in drinking water or something like that. So you have it dialed in to detect lead or chromium or what have you. Um, but for sort of a qualitative analysis, you can connect this ICP to a mass spec. And there you get the, the mass of the metal and its isotope pattern. So it's really unambiguous. You know exactly what you have. And so that would be a, probably the most sensitive technique for detecting this trace amount of catalyst that got this process started. And that would tell you um, that, you know, if you were comparing two polymers, one piece of evidence, one piece that was on the, the suspect, you could look for trace elements of the catalyst that started those polymers. So here's the chain growth monomers. And I've already identified the trend. What is it that, that makes these monomers? It's the double bond. It's the reactive center. And so, you know, most of them have just a single double bond. I'm circling the reactive centers here because there's a double bond here, but it doesn't polymerize with this carbonyl. It polymerizes with the carbon-carbon double bonds. Okay. The aromatic double bonds are not polymerizable. Uh, typically. So these, these would just be like a side group, uh, similar to the, the carbonyls. Um, the chlorine carbon bond is unreactive. And so again, it's that double bond. Here's a, cyan, uh, a triple bond, an alkyne. Uh, it can polymerize too, but it would probably be the double bond that, that is the active group there. Here's tetrafluoroethene. And then this one has two. Okay. So this one is a, is a, a polymer. This is a um, butadiene, because you have four carbons there. And then uh, you can take this and you can polymerize it. And then you have these side chains that are also polymerizable. So this one can be cross-linked very easily. And it can also be branched. And so you can have a polymerization going this way, with you make, make a zigzag, and then this one can polymerize that way. So you can have branched polymerization if you have multiple double bonds. And then here's another one with double bond, with multiple double bonds. So these are all of the reactive centers. These are the polymerization centers. And so know all of these common ones. These are this is a table out of the book. So if you know the naming, reach back to your organic a little bit. There's some unique pieces. Some of the using the the old names like vinyl, right? Um, um, but anyway, this is ethene okay and so when you make a polymer out of it it's polyethylene the thing i don't like about the nomenclature 
is this still has an ENE -E ending, but there are no double bonds left. So you name it by the monomer. So this is the ethylene monomer. And so the polymer name is just poly in front of it. And notice, even though it's ENE, -E, there are no double bonds left. So if you're looking at the repeating unit in, and you're you know, confused, just remember that that's the repeating unit, unit you get from an alkene. And so you're looking at that and naming it, naming the alkene and putting poly in front of it. So this um, should be like chloroethene, but it's also vinyl chloride. And so they just chose the old historical name. And so that's polyvinyl chloride or PVC. And polyethylene is PE. So there was a couple of homework problems asking about these little um, abbreviations. Here's polypropylene. So again, propane would be, you know, fully saturated. So you have one double bond there. So it's propylene. So polypropylene, that would be PP. Here's the styrene molecule. So that's polystyrene, PS. Now here's a tetrafluoroethene. And so polytetrafluoroethylene would be PTFE. The brand name or, or trade name was Teflon, so we call it Teflon. That's the common name for it now. Uh, but the actual, you know, abbreviation would be PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene. Uh, polyacrylonitrile, I don't really um, know of a common abbreviation for that one. So, and, uh, polymethylmethacrylate would be PMMA. And then polyvinyl acetate would be PVA. Now let's look at these. Again, this is a, um, I mean, they're changing the names on us up here. This was vinyl chloride. This looks, it looks like it might be vinyl nitrile, but they call it acrylonitrile. So, um, so polyacrylonitrile. Here we have methyl methacrylate. Okay, this ATE, methacrylate, tells us that there's a, an organic acid in there, carboxylic acid. And so this is a, an ester made out of that acid group. And now notice how this methacrylate here has the, the ATE on it. Uh, that's because this, this carboxylic acid group was reacted with methanol to make that ester. This one, okay, is acetate where it's, the acetate reacted with the vinyl alcohol. And so notice how the acid group's facing the other direction. Now the, the, the um, ester bridge is going towards the monomer. Here it's going away from the monomer. So. Okay, here's a few more. Polyisobutylene, so there's four carbons, so that's where the but butane mute parts comes from. And then the iso, you have this, uh, this um, ternary carbon in the middle. And so that'd be isobutane if this was fully saturated, but it's isobutylene and you put a poly in front of it. Butyl rubber, these all come uh, essentially from trees, polybutadiene, uh, isobutylene and then polyisoprene. So this is the natural rubber, the most abundant monomer that comes out of the tree sap. And it is one that can be branched. Um, it has, after it polymerizes, it still has a double bond. And so then that can, that can branch off. It can be cross-linked very easily. Polychloroprene, so neoprene rubber. So it takes this, um, this uh, polybutadiene uh, and then chlorinates it. And then what that does is it makes it uh, less reactive. So, and then you can take formaldehyde. This is one of the earliest polymers. It's just polymerizing formaldehyde. And it makes uh, this uh, polyformaldehyde or polyoxymethylene a uh, delrin. You'll see plastics listed as, as delrin plastics and they're very, very easy to machine. So we use Delrin a lot. Okay, so those are our sort of survey of monomers.
let's look at the growth mechanisms. So this is actually, <laughs> this starting point, this initiator is actually the nucleophile. So it says it's a, reacting with the nucleophile. It's, it's, it is a nucleophile attacking that monomer and it produces this nucleophilic group that will then attack things like cellulose and protein. So this is very reactive and instantly reactive. If you've ever used super glue and got it on your skin, it bonds immediately and it's so tough. I mean, I get, I've glued my fingers together so many times because I'm working with little small things. And then as soon as I feel it, I'm like, oh, pull my hands apart immediately and you can see little strings of the super glue in between before it dries. I've never really had to like glue them together so much that I had to pull the skin off, but uh, it's, it's pretty dangerous. And so this is the polymerization that it takes. So again, this uh, in this monomer, this is the chain propagating double bond. And so you see that goes down the middle here. And so you see that acrylate side here, that ethyl acrylate or ethyl acrylate on the side. And then you have the nitrile on the other side or the cyano group. So cyano, this piece goes right there. That's the cyano group. And then the acrylate group is that acid on the other side or ester on the other side. Now this would be incredibly easy to determine on the FTIR. Okay, so now which what functionality in this molecule is, is going to be evident on the FTIR? What does FTIR test or look for? We did ICP in a few slides ago, and that was going after what kind of substance? The metals, right? So trace metals, you're going to want to use an optical or uh, like a um, uh, atomic emission or atomic absorption technique, something that looks at, at uh, atomic signatures. FTIR is not atomic. What is it if it's not atomic? It's molecular signals. What 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 about the molecule is it testing? Think about Gaussian when we did all those calculations and vibrational frequencies. And we animated it. What is it animating in Gaussian? The vibrations, right? In this molecule, there's a particular vibration that's unique. Which one is it? Is it the carbonyl? Well, the carbonyl shows up in a lot of places. In any of the acid groups and in uh, the acetates and so on are all going to have carbonyls. But this one has something that the others don't have. It has that nitrile group. So FTIR is great for this guy right here. It's much higher frequency than the, um, if you look up there, you see the, the oxygen. So carbon double bonded to oxygen, 16 to 1700 wave numbers. And what have we done when we change that oxygen to a nitrogen? We made it lighter, okay? So it'll vibrate at a higher frequency than 1700. Above 1700, there's just sort of this desert in the IR where no peaks show up except nitriles. Because that nitrogen is lighter, it vibrates faster. And then we've done something else to make it faster. We've made a triple bond. And so the triple bond moves it to a higher frequency than the carbonyl and the lighter atom makes it higher frequency than a carbonyl. So in all of your um, uh, cyano groups uh, or nitrile groups, you're going to see this peak by itself in the middle of the IR, and that's going to tell you you have a CN triple bond. So, so it really stands out in the IR. So you can really test immediately for anything that has a cyano group or, or a nitrile group. So this chemistry of superglue, you have uh, this structure here, again, this is methyl cyanoacrylate. So the methyl group is right here on the acid group or ethyl. So this is the ethyl cyanoacrylate. And know this general structure is just showing you how it polymerizes. Okay. Uh, they cure in the presence of water. Water gets it started. Um, 
even water in the air vapor is, is enough. So you can evaporate this super glue and uh, they use it to develop forensic evidence. So let's take a top hat. So cyanoacrylate vapor has been discovered to be useful for what forensic application? Creating polymer standards, treating cyanide poisoning, detecting chemical allergies in the forensic laboratory, or developing ridge pattern evidence like finger and handprints. Okay, so we've got a uh, split decision here, and it's the developing ridge pattern evidence or fingerprints. So they'll have these fuming cabinets now. And again, what do we want to do? We had that fluorescent fingerprint powder, and that was to create contrast. And so on rough surfaces, it's really, really difficult to get that powder fine enough and to get it to um, create contrast with those ridge patterns. Uh, what's in the ridge pattern is the sweat and proteins and so on from your body. And so if this um, cyanoacrylate reacts with proteins, then it will react with those ridge patterns and you can see the fingerprint develop. And so it's really handy on, on dark objects and on rough objects, you can get fingerprints on paper, on uh, rough objects like um, rough polymer objects, like a, like this, a handgun or something like that. Let's look at cation growth. So now we have something that's an electrophile and then it's attacked by those electrons. It comes in and it pulls electrons from that double bond and creates a cation that's propagating. So then this cationic species is reactive. And again, it's, uh, it's accepting of electrons, it's electron deficient. And so then it can, it can propagate. And so now this molecule, this monomer comes along, gets close enough, those electrons attack that carbocation, and then it propagates now uh, on and on and on. So we just keep adding monomer units and this cation moves along until it's quenched in some, in some way. Okay, but now we're looking again, we have uh, this initiator that might be forensically relevant. Okay, so we would begin maybe get uh, get some trace uh, detection of that. This has fluorine in it. Um, that's going to be forensically relevant, certainly in the mass spec, because you would have uh, the fluorine um, isotopic pattern in in your uh, mass spec that would stand out. The only problem with these is they're really small concentrations. This is an initiator, so you you know you're going to have the parts per million range, but that's what trace. Uh, trace evidence is. Then we can do the same thing with radical uh, chain growth. So we start with this initiator and this one is going to be very difficult to detect. It does, it's, that's, it's not a fluorine, it's not a nickel, it's not anything that's, that's going to be unique um, that would stand out from the polymer background. So uh, radical initiators would be difficult to detect. But it still might be one of those things that's uh, exculpatory. You know, you got these two objects that you're testing. One has a nickel catalyst that's, you know, detected in trace analysis, and the other one doesn't. You know, so they, there you've got two differences that that you could exploit. Okay, so then this uh, single electron comes and reacts with that double bond, and then 
you push that electron onto the other carbon and so now you have this this uh, free radical here which can do the same thing and propagate along and so then it just keeps pushing that radical to the end of the molecule and now these two can get together and terminate so if this one comes here and sees this one then you can link these two chains together and you have that termination step so this one is really, I like free radical polymerization because it's the easiest to understand. It's just single electrons hopping and making bonds. And it's also easy to understand how it can uh, terminate too. So as soon as this radical center finds another free radical, boom, they can terminate and then the chain growth stops. So, um, you know, this, this is sort of self-propagating and also self-terminating. But there's really no trace evidence of this process. It's just the polymer goes. And so this would be the one situation where that polymer could, could uh, um, start polymerizing without any kind of initiator. Uh, a lot of times these monomers are light sensitive because light can cause this to happen. You can go from a, a bonding to antibonding orbital and a lot of the antibonding orbitals are uh, diradicals or triplets. So the electrons pop apart and now they're on each atom and you've got a diradical, and you've got a reactive species, and it can start to polymerize. Let's talk about some of the physical properties. So here's polyethylene. You can create polyethylene with this uh, free radical process. And you can, if you have lots and lots of uh, um, new starts and, and radical uh, propagation, you can create a highly branched polymer with a lot of short branches. So if you have lots of branches and they're short, it's very difficult to pack that. And so this is a low density. You know, and I said that polyethylene was PE. Well, sometimes we put LD in front of that to indicate low density polyethylene. And if you have long chains with, with little branching, then they can pack together and make high density polyethylene. So this is the HD. In this case, it's not high definition, it's high density. Thanks for laughing at my joke there. <laughs> okay. And so high density for things that you want to be strong and, and maintain their shape, uh, you know, you like this tubing, you know, you it, it can be the same chemically as that bag, but it's it's longer chains and and more strength and and more rigid they hold their shape better if you want something soft and uh, pliable again you can do low density um, polyethylene then there's ring opening polymerization the epoxide functional group is one of the simplest to construct with this so they've taken that double bond and reacted it with the oxygen. And so you make this three-membered ring. And so that's the epoxide functionality. So this is propylene oxide. So it started with propylene, then you react it with oxygen and oxidize it with just one atom, atom of oxygen and make that, that three-membered ring. And then that three-membered ring will, will, um, will open and, and begin propagating. So you can do it with a, a, you know initiator that's a Lewis base. It can attack that carbon and open up that ring and produce that uh, that anion that propagates along. You could do it with a Lewis acid as well and, uh, and propagate, then you have a, a ring that's propagating. And so this is that, that uh, origin of that term epoxy. Now step growth polymerization, one example of that is condensation, but it's not the only example. Um, the condensation polymerization is step growth polymerization. And this is uh, an example where you have to have two compatible functional groups, like in an amine and an alcohol. And so if I take an amine and an alcohol, let's see, we'll come up here like this. I can take these three here and make water. And now I have this. And so since I'm producing water, that's condensation. So a lot of these produce water. 
Not all of them, though. So an, an, an acid and a chloride um, can, uh, let's see, do we show that one on here? No. Um, it'll produce HCl. And so if you have R, O, O, H, So then this can produce HCl and then bond that, that R and make an ester. Okay. And you can drive that reaction as producing HCl. You put that in base or drive that HCl off as a gas. And then you're, what you're doing is you're pulling on the products and therefore the reactants react. And so a lot of times these, we use that tool, the Le Chatelier's Taxi, is we grab one of the products like water and we boil it off or have something that, that keeps the reaction dry and sequesters that water. And if we're pulling the water off and it's a condensation reaction, it's going to pull that reaction forward. And then we can put this in a single molecule. So you can have an amine and an acid together like this amino hexanoic acid. So you have an acid group on one side and an amine on this side, and this is a head-to-tail polymerization. Okay. And so here you, you've got it bonded in this manner, head-to-tail. So everywhere there's an acid group, it bonds with that amine group. We lose water. So this would be a condensation reaction and bonds that nylon 6 head to tail. So that would be our, our polyamide, a nylon 6. Now you can put two things together. You can have adipic acid, which is that 6-carbon diacid, and you can have hexane, hexane diamine. So you have hexane with two amines on either end. And now you have uh, heads and tails. You have heads on this molecule and tails on that molecule. So this is an alternating polymer. So if we call this A and this B, then this is A, B, A, B. And so it's an alternating polymer. They call this one nylon 6,6 six because each of the pieces, the A and the B, have six carbons. And so it's just going along. But you could have, you know, nylon 54 or nylon 45, or what have you. So you can put those together in different ways. And that's called a copolymer as well because it's got two pieces. Let's talk about Kevlar. This is also an, an amide type reaction that, that, for, that is a condensation reaction. So we take this and we lose a water for every one of those um, polymerization steps. And it makes this amide linkage. The nice thing about amides, and even in our body, all our pro proteins are amides, amino acids, and they, ha they can make those structures like alpha helix and beta sheet based upon hydrogen bonding. And so Kevlar can do that as well. And so we have this, this hydrogen bonding piece that is key to the strength of Kevlar. Because if I have uh, mechanical stress on this polymer, it can absorb a lot of that energy by breaking these hydrogen bonds, but that doesn't break the molecule. And so then they can repair itself. So you can stretch these fibers, break the hydrogen bonds, and then they can stretch back and, and relink back. And so that's what makes this such a strong polymer. Also, it's, it's, it's rigid, but it's not exactly linear. So it has, uh, it has some flexibility in these regions here. Now you can do a block copolymer where you can take, say, some Kevlar, polymerize it for a short period of time, and then mix in, say, some, some nylon 6 and have some really flexible regions in there. So you can fine tune these polymers using block copolymerization. Now, here's some other kinds of uh, of uh, monomers that can go in and, and other kinds of things that will be uh, put together in terms of uh, both polymerization and then also additives like stabilizers. Uh, here's, a, here's an acid chloride or HCl and so sort of alcohol chloride functional group that produces HCl. Uh, this is a pretty 
tough one because phosgene is a poisonous gas. Okay. But it mixes with bisphenol A. We lose HCl and we can produce this particular polymer. Um, you've probably seen this. This is Lexan. It's a clear plastic that can be used for um, like bulletproof glass or just you know a glass substitutes lightweight a lot of times uh, your polycarbonate glasses like for your eyes they're made out of lexan you can react to these isocyanate groups okay with alcohols and this is another way of forming an amide so you can come at this with the with an alcohol and uh, and form these, these amide groups. So that's a polyurethane. And then, yeah, so there's just different ways you can do. This is an interesting one, this melamine. So this melamine monomer here, reacting with uh, formaldehyde, look at the way this polymerizes. It makes sheets. So it's got this long, sheet-like matrix, kind of like graphite makes sheets. This makes a, a different kind of sheet. And it's a really good flat coating. So they use it for auto paint top coats and it's really tough. And so it's, you know, protects the paint, protects, uh, protects your car from scratches when rocks get kicked up. And this, this melamine was famous because it was uh, mixed into pet food, okay, to trick the protein test. So protein tests, some of the protein tests uh, were, were testing for the presence of these amines. And so they found that if they mixed in some melamine, they could fake the protein test, okay, for pet food. This happened a while back and I went ahead because it was such an interesting story. I pulled some of the, the articles from that. Um, and then, and so know that structures also bisphenol A, you, you see plastics labeled as BPA free. You may have seen that, and uh, this is bisphenol A. Okay, and I was when I heard that they were worried about the amount of bisphenol A residual in in like plastic cookware or Tupperware or whatever. I thought this is ridiculous because there's no way that it's there at toxic levels because it's a trace impurity, and you don't worry about the the trace amounts of arsenic in your drinking water. Yeah, arsenic's bad, but it's trace levels. It's not hurting you. The toxin is the dose. And so I thought this was, there's no way that bisphenol A is going to be at a toxic level. But then I realized it's not an acute toxin. I read an article on it that said it's an estrogen mimic. That changes the ball game, okay? So acute toxicity would be like a power surge, okay? So in here, the room lights and so on, um, you would be able to detect a power surge if it was big enough, but it would have to be big enough to actually cause the whole system to move. That would be like acute toxicity. But this is what um, hormones do. Hormones do this. This is, this is the hormone, the light switch. And so the toxin is the dose still, but the doses, the relevant doses are minuscule compared to acute toxicity. So that's when, when I heard that BPA was a, was a hormone mimic, I thought, okay, that changes the game completely. And so your level for toxicity drops down maybe three orders of magnitude. So instead of it being nanomolar imp important toxicity, it's the picomolar. And so it's really, really small amounts. Now let's talk about this melamine thing, this scandal. Um, it was a food recall of, Let's see, it happened, yeah, in like around 2009. So they, they recalled pet food and it wasn't any one particular manufacturer of pet food. It was like a whole bunch. Uh, and we were wondering how did uh, say Purina and Imes and all of these pet food companies get hit with this scandal. They can't have been in cahoots with this one contamination. All their pet foods made in different facilities. Well, they traced it back to like the protein powder that they were putting in their pet food, which was made overseas. And this person here, uh, uh, the former head of China's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety was convicted of personally approving uh, unsafe medicines and all kinds of things with pharmaceutical companies um, being bribed to do so. Um, 
and so there was uh, not just pet food, but also medical uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, hundreds of patients' deaths and maybe thousands, and was sentenced to death over this. So it was a serious thing. Um, but yeah, we noticed that pets were getting sick all over the country. Um, the melamine was found in the kidneys and urine of cats that uh, that had died. And, uh, and so melamine, it was interesting, melamine itself was not toxic, but when it reacted with cyanuric acid in the body, then it, it was, uh, it was sort of a, what do they call it? Synergistic effect. Okay. Let's talk about polymer crystallinity. <clears throat> so here's sort of a picture of polymer where we see some ordered regions showing up. And so you, you might think, you know, it's easy to kind of the picture, um, how a small molecule, say like this, would crystallize, right? You might have, um, you know, these, these, uh, this polymer, or not this polymer, but this crystal form and a nice, nice uh, array. You've seen pictures of crystals where you've got, um, you know, this molecule lined up in, in certain patterns, and you can say, okay, I see how that's that's crystallizing, but how does a, a polymer crystallize. You know, you've got this carbon-carbon chain with CH2s on it. You know, what does it mean for that to crystallize? Because it goes on and on and on. It's almost infinite in length in terms of the molecular scale. If you were standing on that polymer and looked both ways, you would see the end of the molecule. Okay. And it's, it's twisted and curled and turned and so on. So what does it mean to have a crystalline polymer? What's, what does it mean with polymer crystallization? I'm trying to get you to struggle with what that means, okay? It's not like a polymer particle in a regular array. That's how we think of crystals, right? You, if you crystallize a substance, you have the same molecule in a regular repeating pattern. But polymer crystallinity, the best analogy I can think of is a zipper, okay? If you think about the size of the side of this molecule, you could have it nestle up against a part of the polymer that also has these little hydrogens on it. And they could interlock in a way. They're really not getting inside each other like a zipper does and, and locking that way, but there's a repeating pattern of slightly positive, slightly negative, slightly positive, slightly negative. And if you line those regions up, they kind of snap together positives and negatives attracted to each other, but they're slightly positives and slightly negatives, but there is that repeating pattern. And if you get them close enough, then they can snap together like a zipper. You know, any one of these little connections in my zipper is pretty weak. Okay. But if I put all of those connections together, then it's pretty strong. And so that's what's going on with polymer crystallinity. Up here, you get those little regions where they nestle together and this is zipped together and forms a hard region. And so this is this is hard here. So that's really the physical problem of crystallinity is it forms these hard regions in the polymer that then you can have this polymer break. And if you if you want the the substance to be strong and not break, then you want to oppose crystallinity. One of the ways to oppose crystallinity is to put in a plasticizer. So those plasticizers keep polymers flexible and they favor the plastic phase over the glass phase. Remember, we froze that tube and made it a glass and then it shattered. Okay, so plastic phase is flexible. But polymer mobility can also assist crystallization. So it's, you put too much plasticizer in there and you can cause things to go, uh, you know, too far towards crystallization. So, uh, you know, a crystalline area, again, those polymers are all lined together. That's, a, that's an oriented polymer, and that's going to be a hard substance. If you keep that polymer twisted and, and, and tangled, then it's soft. Think about the fiber fill inside your jacket. You know, if, it, if that was all lined up, it'd be really hard. And a lot of it's glass fiber, right? Really hard substance, but because it's so fine and so tangled, then it it's, takes up a lot of volume, it's not very dense, and it's very soft. So a lot of this is done through the polymer processing and, and, and the, the macroscopic properties. And so this is, when we make a polymer and we polymerize it, this is what we get. 
we get prills. So the raw material for any polymer processing unit is going to be the polymer prills. They look like, um, hmm. like breakfast cereal, <laughs> right? Like little bits of cereal, you know, it's about that size, maybe a little smaller. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this is pretty pure here. It's very, you know, uh, uniform in color. And so a lot of times you, you may, you may, you may dissolve it. Okay. So you could do solution casting where you, you dissolve that polymer, you run it through a slit, you roll it onto some wheels that are warm and the solvent evaporates, and then you end up with a sheet. So a lot of these are sheet methods. You can put the poly polymer pellets in. So the prills would go in. You have a heated area and an auger bit. So this zigzag here is supposed to represent an auger bit, kind of like a sausage grinder. And it's pushing that polymer down here. It's also melting it and pushing it through a die and creating a film. And then you have these rollers. This time the rollers are cooled and you, you stretch it out and then you wind it up. And so this is a great way to make these films here. So like uh, plastic sheets, they can be turned into plastic bags. If you were to run that through uh, spinnerets like this, then it's kind of like sausage. The polymers coming out and you can put different cross sections in these spinnerets and make fibers. Then you can wind those fibers up and you can make threads. Okay. Then you can use those threads to make cloth or, or larger threads or rope. There's other ways to do it. You could uh, you could do dry spinning or wet spinning or melt spinning. And so you can take that solution, push it through a spinneret, run hot gas in the opposite direction and take that vapor away. Now you would wanna condense that vapor and reuse that solvent again. So we wouldn't just blow this out the top of the roof. Uh, you could melt the polymer and blow cold air on it so that the polymer uh, re, uh, you know, hardens again. And so then you can create with those spinnerets different cross sections. And so these are some of the um, cross sections that come from this uh, fit fibers group. They can make hollow fibers, trilobal fibers, um, all kinds of complex shapes. A lot of times, if you want to make a polymer that's absorbent, you want lots of surface area, especially if you have OH groups on that polymer. And then here's some micrographs. So these are actual micrographs of the cross sections Again, you got this triangular delta or trilobal fibers or even hollow nylon fibers here. So as complex as these get, I just want to bring you back to the natural um, fibers. So this is hair over here and how complex it is in its cross section versus um, the sort of the, the man-made fibers. And even though we think we're getting complex here, we're really no match for what nature can do. And guess what? You've made it. <laughs> so I've really enjoyed the, the year we've had together, the years we've had together. In some cases, we you took PCHEM last year, and now you're here at uh, Forensic Chem. So we'll do the police department tour on Thursday. And then is it the test on Tuesday, or is there a review for the test? No, review. review for the test. OK. So y'all have a, have a great day. Yeah, just whatever you've done to study, just put it in a PDF and upload it. Yeah. Sound good? All right, good. Congratulations. <laughs>